Thank you. Uh, what a truly excellent set of slides. Um, he said I was an expert. Well, I can assure you, um, I'm one of the luckiest men in the world in that every day is a school day. I'm fortunate enough to come to PwC every day and learn. And it was you know, a huge pleasure to hear what you had to say because I learned something from that. Uh, second thing is what a glorious building, what a glorious day. Um, I've been coming to, uh, to Budapest now for almost 20 years. Uh, so I first came about 2002 with, uh, with Accenture, actually. So we were looking to outsource a uh, piece of business into the uh, country here. And uh, it's great to be here. And the third thing to say, for the central bankers, because I believe we're in a, we're in a central bank, uh, for the central bankers in the room, it's a great pleasure to be standing in the central bank. I used to work for the, for the Bank of England. I had the great pleasure of working for Andrew Bailey um, when he was chief cashier, he's now the governor. Um, and the five years that I spent um, in a central bank were probably one of the most important five years of my life. I've worked in the UK Ministry of Defence, uh, I've worked as an engineer, uh, qualified as a lawyer. Uh, but it was only when I worked in a central bank that I really began to understand money. Um, and it was under uh, wonderful people like Andrew Bailey and Paul Tucker that, uh, that allowed that to happen. Uh, and the only other thing to say, I mean, you've got a beautiful quad, okay? The Bank of England has got a beautiful quad. Uh, the interesting story about the, the Bank of England quad is that they grow mulberry trees, mulberry bushes. And the reason they do that is because, obviously, uh, when money was first printed by the Chinese, they used to use the leaves to actually print the money. So, so I'd be interested to know what, what you have growing, growing in your quad, and we can discuss that later. Okay? So look, um, I'm going to start with um, this, for me, is a hugely important slide, okay? Um, as a child, um, I marvelled at radio. Um, I was amazed by radio. I was amazed with what radio achieved. Um, and just let's think about what, what radio is. So before radio, the way we used to transmit messages was with copper wire. And you had Morse code, and you'd receive the, the message at the other end of the Morse code. And it was Marconi that got rid of the copper wire. So think of the magic that we have achieved there, because I, you know, I'm standing here now in this room, there's probably several hundred receivers and transmitters, and it was because of Marconi, Marconi allowed that to happen. So what Marconi did, he got rid of copper wire. Okay, he removed the need for copper wire, and we now have this, this, this magic of radio, which has made so much difference to our life. Our life. Now this is, this is why this slide is so important, and it, it looks very trivial, and it looks very simplistic, but um, I always start my presentations with this slide, and uh, it's got four very, very fundamental components on there. You've got payments, you've got ledger, you've got store of value, and you've got legal contracts. Um, I think you'd all agree with me that you know, payment infrastructure is very separate. So payment infrastructure runs on SWIFT, predominantly cross-border payments. Um, shared ledger infrastructure is very separate, so we have great companies such as SAP, Oracle, Sage, Xero, QuickBooks that run our, our, our general ledgers. Uh, we've got the store of value, okay? Store of value is very much the preserve of the central banks and the settlement banks. Uh, and then we've got this um, fourth segment here down at the bottom, legal contracts, okay? Now, all of those four things are very separate as it stands at the moment. They're all very, very separate functional activities within organisations. Um, I'm going to use the B word for the first time, so I'm going to say Bitcoin. Um, the technology, I wasn't going to say Brexit, because that's, uh, that, that offends British people, unfortunately, but, uh, but that, it's a great shame. Um, but um, Bitcoin creates a technology that allows us to bring those four things together. Okay, that's a slight simplification. But Bitcoin creates the principle of having a shared ledger, which has real, and I may offend a few of the central bankers in the room, but um, I'm happy to pick up the, the argument later. Uh, but, but what Bitcoin allows us to do is to create a shared ledger where we have fully settled units of economic value sitting on it that can be moved from one part of the ledger to another. And that is very different to what happens in current organizations because in current organisations we have the shared ledger, we have payments infrastructure, we have the banks, we have the settlement banks, and then we have the legal conditions that sit in the form of contracts. But in a distributed ledger technology protocol, we can bring those 
three things together, ledger, payment, store, and value, but because it's written in code, because it's written in code, we can attach conditions to the transfer of value. Hugely important, hugely important, okay? And you can see this here, um, right at the bottom, we've got the ledgers, multi-currency, covering lots of legal entities. In the middle layer, we've got the payments infrastructure that moves value between the settlement banks, and then right at the very top, you've got the central banks. I have a, a, a new word that I'm trying to encourage people, you know, some of you will be central bankers, I have a new word that I'm trying to encourage people to use, which is defractionalizing, okay? Because, because of fractional reserve banking, we can talk, we'll talk a little bit about central bank digital currencies, but because of fractional reserve banking, we have two types of money on that page. You've got the commercial money here, and you have central bank money at the top. And what happens is that it's the central banks that make sure that the money that moves between the central, central banks is, is, it has its value restored. Okay, because of fractional reserve banking, money is obviously lent out on the other side when we have capital. That's the way it currently operates. That's the way it currently operates. Um, this slide here, um, there's a little trick here just to make a point. You can see how we merge those three circles there and there like that. Again, I'll say the B word. When we look at a Bitcoin ledger, so the Bitcoin ledger persists 24-7, 365 days of the year. When we look at the Bitcoin ledger, we're looking at units of fully settled economic value, okay? And again, I'm sure, doubtless, at the end, people will open us up for debate. We can have the debate. We can have the debate around the energy footprint. Uh, we can have the debate around the volatility. Uh, we can have the debate about the way the markets are regulated. But, but I come back to my Marconi analogy. When Marconi invented radio, it was pretty expensive, it was difficult to use, it used a lot of energy, okay? But in time, and this is what we're seeing, in time this technology will become more advanced, it will be, become better understood. So, and this is hugely important because, because if we look at a general ledger, we're just looking at a number. And that number, and my wonderful colleague, as an auditor will tell you, he will, he will confirm this, when we look at a general ledger, we're just looking at a number. And that number needs to tie to a balance in a nostro. But when you look at the Bitcoin ledger, you're looking at a unit of fully settled economic value that can be transmitted 24-7, 365 days a year, anywhere in the world, within about 10 to 15 minutes or thereabouts. So it's hugely important. And then it gets worse, unfortunately, or better, depending upon your perspective. Um, all of this starts with Bitcoin. So we go back to January 2009, the first, the first Bitcoin block was mined. There is a shocking number on that page, which is 19,000. Um, this slide, I've been using this slide now for about, um, probably the best part of six, six years. Um, that 19,000 number, I only started a number in there probably in the middle of last year. Uh, I did this slide in September and it had about 9,000 on it. Um, <laughs> It got to December, it was about 11,000. And then I think I had 13,000 in January. As of last week, it said 18,000. And I did a presentation this week and I thought I'd better update it. And I went and checked. And there are now over 19,000 cryptocurrencies. 19,000 digital assets of some form. Uh, and Gallo makes the point um, they're all going to need to be audited. Their accounting tax treatment somehow is going to need to be figured out. Uh, they need to be custody properly. The, the AML KYC requirements that sit around them will need to be managed. So this explosion of, of innovation, this is, this is like the emergence of the internet because it's, you know, you take 24 hours to spin up your own cryptocurrency. It's very much similar to the same way that we create websites. Um, I make that point there because that gives you a sense of where we currently are in terms of cryptocurrencies in the broader sense. Um, July 2015, we have Ethereum. What the Ethereum team recognised was the opportunity to make the value, uh, the transfer of value conditional upon events. And what they did was they, they made it easier for people to use smart contracts. So that's what um, Ethereum gave us. And we get to now, um, we have these third generation coins, which what they're looking to exploit 
is um, improve the energy footprint associated with, with you know, coins such as, uh, as Bitcoin. We've got DeFi, decentralized finance protocols. Um, I've used the word conditional transfer. Because this is written in code, we can create protocols that look very much like what a bank does. Because a bank receives one form of asset and it will provide another form of asset in return in the case of you know, a mortgage, for example. The DeFi protocols that are now being created on decentralized ledgers, they're doing quasi-bank-like activities. They're taking one form of asset and they're locking it and they're releasing another form of asset. Um, I, I, I presented to a board last week and um, one of, one of, it wasn't a colleague, but it was, uh, it was somebody from the same, from the same organization. He, he said that the DeFi protocols will provide three orders of magnitude of efficiency relative to conventional banking infrastructure. And then the question was posed, does that mean it's a third? And the individual can say, so he's actually a chemical engineer, but he said three orders of magnitude. So it's 10, 100, 1000. Okay, because you can create code that does things that bank do, that the, that the banks do, and you can run it on decentralized ledgers. Very, very important. We've got the central bank digital currencies. Very, very interesting. So we issued our uh, PwC issued our PwC CBDC global index uh, this year. So that came out about two weeks ago. And what we do is we rank the progress of the central banks globally with respect to their central bank digital currency projects. Very, very interesting topic, and um, um, not necessarily in this session, but I think maybe afterwards we can have some Q and A on that, because I, I do think, for me, one of the challenges, I'm a you know, big believer in the technology, but I think one of the big challenges is the fact that, because it's not state-backed, right? If things happen to these protocols, it poses great systemic risk, okay? So what we need, for me, the central bank digital currencies are a vehicle to underpin this broader space. And I know that runs counter to some of the views in terms of the libertarian views, but I think somehow we have to find a balance between what this technology can achieve and the need for stability uh, within society. Um, we've got stable coins, very interesting. So what stable coins do is that they um, give us, they provide a, um, a regulated uh, deposit taker to take a, a fiat currency. And then what we can do is we can use a digital currency to reference that. So we have a digital currency that is backed by a, a deposit in a regulated institution. Uh, we've got the NFTs and we've got the metaverse. And this, this has seen a huge explosion in the last uh, three or four months now. Um, because what we're actually looking at here is just ones and zeros, okay, a binary, pictures are just numbers. Okay, so what we can do is we can take all of this technology and we can use it to create unique imagery and lock the unique imagery to an individual so they own it. So last year we see art auctions, people, $69 million that piece of artwork went for, that's a piece of unique digital art. And then what we're then seeing, we'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about this in a minute, but what we're then seeing is the NFTs, I can create a digital art which is unique to me which is locked to me, which persists in value. So some of you will have children, some of you will have children that play Minecraft and Roblox and uh, Fortnite, and they spend money in it. Which is a big waste of money, <laughs> forgive me. But, but the value doesn't persist, okay? But in the case of an NFT, value will persist because it can be locked and controlled by me and I can move from different, different environments. And then we have this concept called the metaverse, which, which we'll touch on as I said. But this is, this is an augmented reality, an augmented reality which is virtual. It, it's, it's like climbing into a matrix type world. But all of this technology allows us to transfer value within that, within that environment. So it's, thinking, it's like Facebook meets Instagram, meets Twitter, meets banking infrastructure, which means, which means crypto. Okay? Um, Bitcoin, why is there so much interest in Bitcoin? And I love this slide. I absolutely adore this slide. Um, can anybody tell me what that price profile is over the last 160, 70 years? If you look carefully, you can probably see it. Who can shout out? What's that price profile for? Come on, it's not difficult. There we go. What's that one? 
What is it? Yeah. Look at that. Can you see how similar they are? Yeah. Now there's a little, there's some, there's some market theory going on here, and I haven't explored this, but I'm sure some of you are economists in the room. But this is all about asymmetric information flow. So the way a market trades is that people know something, people don't know something, and that drives the price profile. And that's exactly what's happening here. This is the, this is these these two markets reaching a natural equilibrium over time in terms of um, the way the way the market, the market trades over a period of time. The people the reason why people are interested in Bitcoin is because because it acts as an inflation hedge. Okay, supply is going to be limited to twenty one million. Uh, currently about eighteen point nine or thereabouts. Bitcoins have been actually mined. So investors, so you've got. Uh, Paul Tudor Jones over there, you know, they see this in a high inflation global economy, they see Bitcoin as a, as a, as a natural inflation hedge. Okay? Uh, and it's largely the hedge funds, what we're not seeing yet is, is a big inflow from the institutions into, into this technology, but I'm sure in time, because it is perfectly possible to, to, to hold Bitcoin in a manner which is perfectly hygienic. So we can actually scan the assets at the point of receipt into, into a custodian. Um, on the NFTs, I've made the point, the term NFT stands for non-fungible, non-fungible token. Fungibility means it can't be exchanged, it's unique, and we've got some examples down there, so the Mona Lisa is unique. And as I said, the great advantage of this technology is it allows me to take digital assets, make them unique, and lock them to myself. And what we're seeing now, um, are these projects, well, what they do is they take physical assets and they create non-fungible <laughs> versions of those in a digital environment. Um, and the money, um, I think 40, they raised in excess of a billion dollars. So what 40 want to do is create an environment that allows gamers to code, but what they have in there is all of the blockchain, fiat, crypto, money playing that allow new types of games, new types of Fortnite to be created. That, that rely on this technology that lock visual value to individuals that control by control by a private key. Um, HSBC Sandbox HSBC is sponsoring a sports ground in Sandbox, which is a metaverse. Um, if you haven't, any hands up? Have you been in a metaverse environment? There we go. We've got one. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, these are going to be the new environments where people will come and do commerce um, because they bring all of these existing commercial platforms together. Um, they integrate it in a way um, that's, that's that's very different to what we have currently. HSBC see the opportunity, so they put a stake in the ground in the ground there, quite literally in terms of the sponsorship arrangement that they've put in place. Um, we as PwC, so we've bought a piece of land. Uh, in Sandbox, and again, we and you know, some of the wonderful narrative that uh, Gabor presented there. I mean, we see the importance of actually having a brand in that sort of environment uh, for the future. And then we have JP Morgan, and you can see their little brand up there, Onyx. Um, so Onyx is a is basically it's a, it's a, it's a treasure management solution. And what it does is it virtualizes money in a way that's very different from. Uh, using traditional payments infrastructure, and it allows people to move money 24-7 with ease. And again, JP Morgan see the opportunity in there. They put their brand in there. It's an early stake in the ground in terms of um, you know, establishing establish, establish themselves in these kind of you know, this, this new type of technology. Um, so we've got these five big trends. Um, we've got CBDCs. We've got the registry environment. We've got you know, the, the, the historic players, you've got people like Coinbase, Ledger, Wallet Provider, you've got BitGo as a custodian. You've got decentralized finance, you've got Web3 for a metaverse context. And then you've got the large corporates and the financial institutions. Um, and then right in the middle there, you've got the SG impact and how all of this needs to be brought together. Uh, and that's the responsibility of us in the room. We are responsible for this, so we're policymakers. Uh, we're consulting firms, we're standard setters, we're industry bodies. So somehow, 
we've got to work out how we bring all of this together because it's not going to go away. Um, you know, this, this genie of Bitcoin has been released out of the lamp and it's going to be very, very difficult to put the magic back in. Okay, so we have to work very hard and actually understand how we can work safely uh, with these companies. Um, just for reference, so we like to segment the market as follows. So we like to think of the issuers, the investors, the providers, the miners. We like these three groups down here. So the wallet providers, the exchanges, the custodians. Um, this is slightly out of date. I mean, we'll probably add in there the asset managers because I think the asset managers are going to start to realise the need to be able to custody these kind of assets. Um, I'd also add in maybe the crypto finance people. So we see staking, um, lending of these assets. Um, so they will um, they will be added onto this slide um, probably within the next month or so. But we as PwC, we love working with people who are regulated. Uh, who want to be regulated, and that's what we do. And we also work with regulators as well. So very proud to say that we have two, globally, I personally have two clients which are regulators, uh, and it's great to work with them and actually step through and help them build, um, I'd like to think, cross-fertilised regulatory environments so that we take ideas from there and we share them over there, and we have learning from another entity, and then we're continually iterating in terms of raising the bar that needs to be applied. So look, this is a, this is a deck that we refer to as you know, reinventing the future, okay? Um, I mean, I had a conversation, a wonderful conversation with, with, uh, with um, a Hungarian entrepreneur, and um, yeah, what, what are you trying to do? Okay, let's, let's break this down. Why is it gonna be different? What do you need? What's the challenge? Uh, what's the problem in society you're trying to resolve? And so you don't understand that. It's very difficult to progress to, to the next stage, um, which is what are the regulatory implications of what you're trying to do? Okay, because it's going, we like working with people who are regulated, who want to be regulated, and you break that down into what's the product, what's the service, because they are different. Who are the customers and where are they? I mean, radio fascinates me because um, it is one of the only things that has a single global regulator. Because you have the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, and when, when Mark Cain invented radio 120 years ago, the, 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 the countries of the world all came together and they realised this technology is really important. Radio is really important. And they established some global principles that would apply in relation to how we treat radio. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, I think the same will have to apply in relation to digital currencies because it's globally pervasive. Bitcoin doesn't have a legal entity. It can operate without any sort of legal entity whatsoever, which makes it very difficult to manage in the context of traditional business. Um, <clears throat> in the UK, in London, I sit as part of the um, financial crime team. So I act as an expert witness. Um, so I have acted as an expert witness in both criminal and civil cases in the United Kingdom. Um, I've seen some dreadful things happen to people, okay, in relation to uh, using this technology and the loss of value. Um, uh, but I will say it's perfectly possible, as I said, to look at the hygiene footprint associated with Bitcoin and manage it accordingly. Um, these are my, I've got to give my, my wonderful audit colleagues, my great friends in audit who I absolutely love, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, tax is slightly better, but, but audit, I love the audit guys, always love the audit guys. Um, I, I, you know, I'm an engineer, okay? You know, so, you know we build, you know, we're an electrical engineer. My, my, my uncle built power stations in, in Dubai. Engineers risk managers, that's what they do. They build bridges so they don't fall down, okay? I'm a process guy, I'm a control guy. You know, uh, and I look at these businesses and I apply exactly the same control risk framework in terms of setting them up so they run properly. Um, audit's a huge important. Audit's absolutely essential. There are 19,000 protocols up there that will need to be um, audited at some point, presumably if they, if they still continue. Um, and again, you know, who are the people involved? Who are they? Where have they come from? What's the history? You know, I mean, I start most client engagements with what does the LinkedIn profile look like? That's where I have to go to first. Check them out on LinkedIn. So, Suppose this all starts with Bitcoin, 
if you want to blame anybody, you can blame Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, whoever he or she or they are. But we're not going to get rid of it. This is going to be there. It's going to be difficult to, to put this back in the in the, you know, the lamp, the genius lamp. So we have to work with it. Uh, custody is very much the entry point, I think, for any of these businesses because if we have it in a regulated custodian, that's a big tick in the box because it's got some hygiene around it. I love the term coin hygiene. It's a big word that I'm promoting within within PwC. Coin hygiene, coin hygiene, because we can look at the assets and we can see how clean they are, which is very different to traditional money. But I can scan Bitcoin addresses and I can tell you how hygienic they are. Um, I mean, this is not just about digital assets, but as I've said, we have this bleed through now into DeFi, NFTs, metaverse technologies, hugely interesting. Um, next chain companies, very, very interesting. Um, the challenge with software, and I come back to my opening, opening slide, the challenge with software is it just moves messages, right? Everything within an organization is just moving information. We can build companies that actually move real value. Right? And if you think about it, at the perimeter of a company, you've got suppliers. At the other part of the company, you've got customers. And then you've got goods and services that go in, goods and services that come out, and you've got contracts and contracts. What happens in between is a load of systems and software and people that are trying to make sure that the suppliers do the stuff customers get what they want. With this technology, we can reinvent the way the software within a company operates. So it's not moving messages, it's actually receiving real value and transmitting real value. It then implies that the general ledger is up to date 24-7, 365 days of the year, because it settles real time, which means you don't need things like North Shore Reconciliations, which changes profoundly the requirement from an audit perspective. So it's very, very interesting what we can do. Next generation companies. So you know, think of this as sort of, you know, 120 years ago, Marconi's just invented radio, and we sit in a room now, and there's four, five hundred transmitters, receivers, and this is where this, this technology will go. Um, finally, very importantly, is obviously from an ESG perspective. Um, I mean, Bitcoin gets a bad rap because of the energy footprint, um, but you are actually getting. You know, four things in there because you get your general ledger, you get your payment and store of value with the opportunity for conditional transfer of value. So you're actually bringing four functional concepts together. Um, ESG is hugely important um, and this room is consuming energy. Okay? I mean, you drive a car, you press the foot on the accelerator, the car speeds up. How do you slow it down? You put your foot on the brake, right? What does that generate? Heat energy. So every time you break, you're wasting energy, okay? So if we're gonna have the ESG debate around digital currencies, we've gotta look at ourselves in the mirror and talk through everything that we do and not just think about the problems with Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin's a bit like a steam engine, okay? We establish the principle we can put coal, turn it to steam, move the engine along. In the future, we can, we can reinvent it, which is what we see with these, these third generation digital currencies. So look, it's a pleasure, absolute pleasure. I mean, it's my first time I've ever spoken in, in, in Budapest. So uh, as I said, I've been coming here for 20 years, so it's an absolute pleasure to be with you in this esteemed institution. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. I think it's, uh, it's really important to hear the other, other side as well. Thanks for the wonderful jokes as well. I think we really appreciate that. Um, and, and, and we are coming almost to the end uh, of, of the conference. Maybe just one administrative reminder before we move on. I think there is a possibility to ask questions from the presenters. So we have, I think, uh, not a lot of questions arriving online, but uh, feel free to, if you are online, to, to drop in questions to any of the, uh, of the presenters, so just general questions that we decide. There will be a little time at the end uh, for questions. So we would really appreciate if you would have some. Also, if you are sitting in the audience, I think we will have uh, an opportunity to, uh, to address your questions. So try to think about that. And I think uh, the, the last presentation that we are going to hear today is going to be online. So I keep my fingers crossed that the technology is going to work. Um, we have talked a little bit about all aspects of, uh, of the new world of finance. And uh, one of the sponsors of this event is also ACCA, 
being the global organization for the contents and finance professionals, uh, ACC has a professional insight team. So they do surveys, research, and do actually quite a lot of really, really good thought leadership publications uh, on, on various topics. One of these topics will be presented by the head of professional insights from ACCA. And uh, my apologies if I'm going to butcher your name again. So, Narayanan Vaidyanathan, Head of Professional Insights from ACCA, uh, and is going to talk about a survey that ACCA has recently done uh, on the impact of fintech developments. This is part of fintech that we have just discussed on finance professionals in the future. So, with that, I hand over to uh, Narayanan. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you can hear me. You can. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And you didn't butcher my name at all. I think that was a very, very good effort. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to join all of you here today and to listen to some, frankly, fascinating presentations across a, a range of uh, uh, all of your very, very deep expertise. Um, as mentioned, I'm Narayanan and I'm with the ACCA. Uh, and I want to perhaps shift gears a little bit with all of you uh, right now which is uh, to zoom out from, from the crypto um, uh, kind of deep dive that we've been in and product deep dive that we've been in uh, and uh, uh, reflect, if I may, a little bit on what is ACCA's core business, which is we are in the education sector um, and we are in the business of um, developing skills. We're in the business of helping people have meaningful careers, meaningful work. Uh, and uh, what we'd be reflecting on is what uh, the fintech space offers accounting and finance professionals in terms of exciting skills, in terms of meaningful work, because we feel that as a public interest body, uh, what we care about, and this has been talked about by many previous speakers, what we care about is not you know, making money in crypto, we have no interest in that, but what we're interested in is a responsible approach that delivers um, long-term value, that adds something to the ecosystem, um, and for that, you need accounting and finance professionals who know what they're doing, who are engaged with it, and who are ready for the long term themselves, who are committed to it. And, and we have an interest in helping, being part of the solution in, in creating that pool of um, skilled professionals. So that's really, if you like, uh, where we're coming from in this discussion. What I might do is I'm going to try and share some slides. I don't know if that's uh, that's going to work or not, but I'm going to give that a shot and let's see where we get to. Um, I'd be very grateful if somebody could tell me if they can see my slide. Yes, I think we can see your slides. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, uh, as it says there, it's really uh, the purpose of my comments is is a bit of a uh, a bit of a reflection on the state of play from the perspective, I guess, of careers and, and the opportunity that it represents for uh, finance professionals. So I'm sure I don't need to tell all of you in this room, but for the, uh, in the interest of completeness and context, uh, so of course with FinTech we're talking about financial services, meeting technology, <coughs> excuse me, and essentially to transform how financial services, using tech to transform how financial services are delivered and consumed, whether that's through new business models, through applications, processes, products, all of that. Automation essentially being used to uh, improve the proposition. Um, so I guess, you know, a good starting point for us uh, in this work was why do we care? Uh, why does FinTech really matter? Uh, and, and I guess, you know, some of the things that uh, are worth bearing in mind is firstly, it's a thriving sector with, with many diverse components. Um, as you can see on the right hand side there um, in the survey that was referred to earlier. So we surveyed about 5,700 accounting and finance professionals globally, so about 100 plus countries. Um, and we looked at um, a range of different um, uh, applications within FinTech, whether it's um, you know, um, how it's used in money transfer, many of you will be familiar with, you know, peer-to-peer -peer type models, um, online only digital banking models, mobile and contactless payments, and of course everything is in B2C, whether it's with the back end using APIs, 
um to connect systems together to transfer data, whether it's point of sale systems for payments credit scoring and of course some investment banking related things like trading settlement and so forth and of course peer-to-peer lending which is perhaps um more front-facing red tech and to today's discussion things like cbdc's and and cryptos and nfts and of course some some areas like crowdfunding insure tech so uses and insurance um and in the wealth management industry and if you look at i guess the cbdc bit and the cryptos and nfts overall i'd say they're seeing roughly one in ten so seven and eleven percent so roughly about ten percent people uh you know report uh that their that their organization feel like is is kind of active um uh, in this space um uh, using for itself or for clients and i think what i'd say is um uh you know fintech is a global story so you know this isn't just about um advanced uh, markets or, or technologically you know we see and, and many of you will be aware um a huge amount of fintech activity as as is evidenced by today's conversation in the, in the CEE region but you know this was a global survey and, and a lot of the conversation is in places like Africa for example where there's there's a huge amount of work around um and and it's not new it's been there in 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 places like Kenya for for more than 10 15 years now around um, a mobile um uh devices for for money transfer and so forth so uh you know it's a space that is uh it's a conversation that's important and it's a conversation that's going to get um progressively much more important as well uh it's also something that is uh you know the data suggests gaining trust uh, particularly with, with with younger customers uh with younger consumers if you look across the age bands there for 18 to 35 uh, and then 36 to 55 and then 55 plus um and the question was do you trust fintech more than you know track finance some call it traditional finance products uh so the net is is very much a positive um in that youngest age group um it's still positive in the middle age group and and it only gets negative in in the latter age group so i think you know as these consumers become a bigger and bigger part of um uh, uh the, the the landscape and and of, of the paying customer if you like uh, over time fintech is going to get more and more familiar and more and more embedded over time very clearly um and uh you know it's really as it says their disruption is at the heart of the, the logic of fintech um looking at how traditional finance operates and and doing it in a way that's cheaper better and faster uh and you know i'm not going to read all of that on this slide here but, but you know just in that context of cheaper better faster it's easy to sometimes think that you know fintech is about throwing out traditional banking and replacing it with fintech but i think the story is much more nuanced than that i think when when it first started uh, you know green traction whether it's 10 years ago or whatever it is you want to take as your starting point there was this thing that uh, you know if you look at markets like the uk where uh, you know you've had for for the longest time you know four banks maybe you know, pretty much dominating the entire retail market and and I'm guilty of that as much as the next person I've backed with the same bank since I was at university which is you know going back a good 25 years now so uh you, and and there was a thought that maybe you know fintech is really going to come in and and essentially you know kill the banks you know it's going to be completely new of doing things and I think generally speaking there is an uh, I think many people <coughs> will take a view that it's a bit more of a collaboration plus competition story um you know there are some things that the fintechs do very well there are some things that incumbent um banks do um better uh, and and also where they have certain advantages whether you know if you look about user experience on one side of fintechs uh, but also you know long standing customers and I'm an example of that inertia to change perhaps um even the approach to technology so this cloud native and digital first certainly the advantages there with fintechs they don't have the legacy infrastructure issue then of course um, you know strong internal controls and this was mentioned by some of the previous speakers in cyber security frameworks um you know product ranges perhaps is is an advantage of fintech but then product safety uh, you know can get talked about in terms of the traditional providers um accessing new types of demographics and new types of customers that might get ignored um you know whereas you know uh, data insight from millions of existing customers is is something that uh, uh you know is is something available ready and so the entrepreneur within the large banks often um uh, you know is trying to straddle that that middle ground um being nimble and quick on the one hand but on the other hand scaling quickly using the existing customer base competitive pricing versus brand trust and you know 
uh, often minimal physical presence, but then, you know, cost of regulation. This is an industry which is uniquely dependent on regulation almost, so the ability to absorb that cost can be a big factor. And, you know, when we think about accounting and finance professionals, you know, it's been talked about in great detail, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but, you know, there are obviously some, you know, if you think about some basic conversations, you know, that CFOs mentioned to us, obviously volatility is a key one in terms of crypto assets in particular. You know, cross-borders talked about sometimes in terms of stable coins because they're pegged to a specific fiat currency and whether that offers a way to move money around in an efficient way. But there are also risks cited there, which is that the way they're treated depends on jurisdictions, and in some jurisdictions, stable coins are treated much more like crypto, so they could get hit with a lot more regulation, so it might not be as efficient as it looks initially. Payments for goods and services, we're seeing some people talking about, you know, clients and others of theirs using cryptos for payments for goods and services, and I think it's fair to say, similar to the volatility point, most CFOs, at least that we speak to, are not very comfortable, you know, relying on it in any meaningful way in their organizations, and on the payment side, the similar approach is, if it does make sense, they would rather see there's an opportunity to use a third-party agent to do the crypto to fiat currency conversion so that they continue with as CFOs in their organizations dealing with fiat, but, you know, using a third party for the crypto conversion, I think it seems to be the way of thinking. And, you know, where there is CBDC conversations, sometimes the thinking is, you know, is this possibly a way, because it's an efficiency play ultimately, you know, CBDCs and whether, because the operational cost, whether the operational cost of handling it will be attractive relative to the, you know, the way of dealing with cash and sort of a working capital kind of option that it might provide. So these are some of the, you know, kind of thinking, early thoughts that are coming through, at least from where we are sitting. Certainly managing regulatory complexity is a key factor, and whether that's around regulatory alignment between countries based on common principles, using red tech to reduce the cost of dealing with compliance. And, you know, a small proportion, but a fair few do feel, and perhaps this is the cautious prudence aspect within the competency and finance professions, but they feel, you know, controlling the rollout of some areas of fintech and regulations is frankly more clear and developed. And, you know, there's possibly a very sensible argument for that in some cases. So I think it's probably worth saying that fintech is ultimately a data play. Everything in fintech is data. And the minute you've got data, you've got cyber. So I think this really came through as a real concern around cyber security risks linked to fintech adoption. And I think it will be something that will need to be carefully considered as we think about that first slide I was talking about where the younger customers mature and fintech becomes much more embedded. The cyber security aspect will also become that much more important. I think around the role of government, I think there are a few different themes here that came through. I think building links internationally to learn best practice and organizations like ACCA, you know, we have obviously on the ground offices and presence like many of the global organizations here in, you know, probably 100 countries or so. And I think there's a real opportunity there for regions and countries to learn from each other. Education is a key thing, labs and regulatory sandboxes, and this is where government can really help. I think also the role of government was cited a lot around the development agenda. So, you know, this isn't just about, you know, financial inclusion is a key part. I was talking about fintech for delivering finance cheaper, better, stronger, cheaper, better, faster, and, you know, cheaper and better is often where you can access pools of customers who might not be able to access traditional payment rails or financial rails. So there's a big role there potentially for government that's coming through. And I think the other thing I also talked about, which was interesting to us, is encouraging fintech adoption in smaller cities. You know, in many countries, often it's one city that's driving it, which might be the big city or the capital city. And I think fintech is the sort of thing which can really come through in terms of driving much more of a much more of a story across cities in the country beyond the one or two big cities. 
And I think part of fintech also is the culture. Um, and it's also, this is part of that disruptive thing where it's around innovation culture and, and really driving a different way of doing things. Um, we spoke to a range of people in the course of this uh, research. The report, by the way, will be out um, uh, by at end of May. Um, and um, uh, it, that's just a quote there from one of the people that we worked with in, in the report. But I think what it really highlights, this individual is an ACCA member, and what it really highlights is uh, you know the uh, the cultural shift that there can be uh, between moving uh, from a traditional banking environment to moving to fintech and the ability to 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 pivot and to be able to be flexible is, is a really big factor for accountancy and finance <clears throat> for accountancy and finance professionals um, who are seeking to succeed in a fintech environment and this is really I guess speaking to my um, point around when you're thinking about um, uh, Careers, I think, I think that will be uh, a really big factor, which will differentiate those who um, you know, build successful long-term careers in this space. Obviously, COVID is is a big factor as well, and uh, it's had a huge role to play in increasing. It's a, it's clearly a uh, you know a hugely unfortunate, massive human human tragedy, and I don't think we should we should um, lose sight of that. But it is also true that um, it has had a huge role to play in increasing engagement with digital and, and fintech as a sector uh, has uh, has therefore ended up um, uh, being much more in the focus of uh, people who might not have otherwise thought about it. Uh, and I think doing that in a responsible way, ESG was mentioned, whether it's financial inclusion, whether it's things like um, financial wellness. Um, and, and, and managing your money um, using AI-based tools, for example. There's a whole host of things. Those are just a couple of examples, but uh, I think it, it plays a real role, uh, FinTech, in, in all of that. Uh, so I think, you know, just to round it all out, I was talking about opportunities in finance, and I think what we saw was about half of the people you know, that they see career opportunities for themselves in FinTech. Um, I think about 14%, um, uh, as it says there, don't. And about a quarter, uh, you know, when they say neither agree nor disagree, they don't see it right now, but they, they don't definitely say that they're not going to see it. Um, so I think they're sort of on the fence a little bit, while about a 10%, uh, you know, simply don't know. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, this is something which is on the radar um, and will continue to be more and more on the radar uh, in terms of the report itself, which I said is coming out. So what we've done with the report is, you know, we didn't want it to be just about the data. I think it makes it much more real when you have people who are in the field. Um, so we identified 10 types of jobs that we already see from, you know, our membership. Um, and I apologize, I should have said this earlier, but this is a joint report between ECCA and Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand um, for, uh, you know, the geographic coverage from their part of the world as well. And their strategic partner of ours that we've done a lot of work with in the past as well. Uh, and you know, the 10 job roles that we've got there, CFOs, financial controllers, auditors, digital transformation leads, uh, digital accountants, so really using, uh, you know, providing accounting services around, you know, uh, everything from payroll upwards in a completely app-based way, um, regulatory experts, we have, you know, people who are uh, helping shaping uh, some of the um, evolving regulations around areas like crypto, actually, uh, tax advisors, uh, fintech strategists around uh, things like um, uh, so this is for example in uh, uh, digital currencies and uh, uh, actually there's an example from Nigeria around uh, the e-naira and, and uh, you know the considerations around rolling out at scale um, uh, central bank digital currencies and the impact of the economy so you know many of those kind of things people who originally trained as accountants are getting involved in as well very top-down strategic type of roles um, entrepreneurs many of them have uh, you know set up their own fintechs and, and senior managers who do things like um, product uh, lead roles um, um, where they're, uh, for example, um, uh, in the payment space or, or even um, head of operations roles. So uh, a whole rich wealth, if there's one takeaway that I would want people to have from this uh, set of comments that I'm putting through it is that, um, you know, people who've trained and started through qualifications like ACCA are going on to do a whole range of rules which are rich, which are varied. Um, you know, that um, when I think about the crypto conversation today, that regulatory expert role I know has, we have an example in the report, uh, which is around uh, cryptos. Uh, the FinTech strategist role has, uh, is, is around. Uh, a I hope 
he was on his last slide already, or, or kind of on his last yeah, slide already. If, uh, if, if the technology cures, then I think we will, we will probably give the word back to Mariana for, for finishing off his presentation. Uh, in the meantime, I think we are pretty much on schedule, so uh, we have uh, some time reserved now for questions. And maybe uh, just commenting on this slide, why, why we are waiting that, that he's coming back. I, I'm not sure if you've seen or known the website called Will Robots Take My Job? And, okay. and I think if you go there, I think uh, for accountants, this, which is by the way the most searched item on that website, uh, so the contents are the most worried about robots taking their job, it is 95%. Uh, but it is really, really good to know that we have some future in the yeah, fintech yeah. industry. <laughs> Even if the robots will take our jobs in, in the traditional finance space. So I think with that, um, uh, maybe we'll open the floor for questions. Just for the online audience, I think it's, it's important to know that we can't unmute you. So if you, if you have a question, please drop uh, the question in, in the chat window. I think we had so far one question or one comment coming from the online audience so i will probably take it after we address some other questions from the audience and if you are sitting here feel free to also ask questions please address it to uh, the appropriate person who, who was presenting um, or, or maybe we'll try to allocate it to, to the right person so question there Yes, thank you. My name is Arthur Bolaj, I'm from PwC, and my question is for Hayden. Um, how do you see the future role of traditional commercial banks in this evolving universe? We're asking the question different. Yeah. Who will survive? And then maybe, maybe I think we need to uh, repeat the, the question again from the online audience even here. So, question to Hayden. Uh, how do you see the, the role of the traditional finance organization in the future? Is it a survival game or something else? So, um, I mean, that, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, and um, a similar point cropped up last week as part of this, this board presentation we made. And I think the way to think about it is the banks, the banks historically have been used to dealing with physical things. Okay? So money was traditionally physical in nature. It was gold. It was banknotes, it was ledgers, um, and the banks got very good at doing that because they were very good at managing physical things, the security of physical things, the security of physical gold, coins, etc. And then software was invented, computers were invented in the 1950s and 1960s, and then as we went through the 1970s and 1980s, banks realised that they could take software and computers, and obviously with the central banks, they realised that we can start moving money around the world with software and messaging and computing. And in some ways, the banks actually became software specialists. Okay? They became specialists in software that moved money. Right? But the problem now is that that secret, if you like, is out of the box. Okay? Because we now have open source, Bitcoin is open source, so we now have open source protocols that everybody can download, okay? And they can work out how they can create a store of value that can be moved around the world. Um, but I still think there's lots of opportunities for the banks, and I think there's, there's a couple of interesting aspects to that. I think that, I mean, the banks, what do banks do? They, the banks are there for security, okay? So they move value securely. I don't, I don't see any reason, and it's, it's quite interesting, you compare the role of the bank with the role of the general ledger company, for example, the general ledger companies store information, right? So big general ledger companies, they, they store numbers on big general ledgers. They don't do value, right? And I think there is a big role for the banks, or whatever they may be, because they could be hybrid, and they could be something more than a bank. And I'll talk about Facebook in a minute. Um, but I, I see a big role for the banks to come together with the general ledger companies and become hybrid software companies. So they're actually, you know, bringing together ledger, payment, store of value and conditions in one place because it's that in integrative capability. Because as wonderful as some of the projects are, the crypto projects, br as brilliant as they are, we haven't got the, the regulatory, the policy, the accounting expertise that will make that happen. Now, interestingly, Facebook had an initiative called Deal. 
uh, which is their stable coin. Um, and if you get the opportunity, there was a piece written in the FT, it was about six weeks ago, which, which talks about the story of Diem. If you think about Facebook, Facebook's got 2.7 billion customers or thereabouts globally. With a stable coin, which is what Diem wanted to be, with a stable coin within Facebook, Facebook could be a bank, basically, because it's moving money around. Um, but the regulatory <coughs> challenge is immense because you've got to deal with the regulatory interconnect with the regulators in each jurisdiction. And that's what banks are very good at doing because the banks understand how risk, societal risk as a financial institution can be managed. So I think that there, there, is, there is a very nice interplay here. I think you know, the banks went from being physical companies, did dealt physical things, to software companies, albeit it was just one dimensional, so it focused on store of value. But I think there's a, there's a broader opportunity to become multi dimensional. And by that, I mean store of value, payment, ledger, contract. But there's no reason why you can't have a branded stable coin that relates to Coca Cola or McDonald's that has an experience attached to it. So I think there's some very interesting opportunities there. Thank you. So. Thank you. Okay, so any, any other questions from the audience or uh, I think we've got so far not a lot of questions from the online audience. Many of the presenters, I can talk about the accounting for quite, <laughs> quite, quite, quite some time. I'll ask you a question. <laughs> so so, so how, how do the professional institutions deal with the audit challenge in terms of you know, coming together? How do the EYs, the Deloitte's, the KPMGs, PwCs actually come together and, and, and define an audit standard for, for crypto? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question and I think it, it is probably one aspect is the, is the firms itself uh, and the other aspect is the, is the regulators. I think the, the number that I've shown about the, the 13 years to get to, uh, I would say, a much more simpler standard shows how big the regulators are. Um, so I think the, the participants of the market, in this case the, the participants of the audit market, would need to get together because probably the regulators would, would not be solving the issue very quickly. Uh, I was looking at uh, the ISB's agenda, the accounting regulators, and it took, took four years to discuss whether they put the accounting of crypto in their agenda or not. That, that took them several years to decide, and I think they still have not decided. I think that is, there is a lot of uh, responsibility that is falling on the, on the large players in the market. Uh, we do have some guidance uh, published as, as, as PwC. I think uh, some of the other net, big network firms have also some, some guidance published on the topic. Again, I think it is, it is important to know that this is like not the regulation, just kind of best practice that, that we are trying to gather in, in the absence of, of real regulation uh, in, in the topics. Um, then we discussed with the, the, the regulator what are the top three topics that uh, we would need some, some guidance. Uh, definitely crypto, accounting for crypto and auditing crypto was in the top three. So let's hope that it is not going to be the, the market players but more the regulators who are providing the unified guidance. Uh, there is some diversity on the, on the market, especially when you get into the, to the details. Uh, but more or less, I think uh, the, the large firms see the, the issues in a very similar light. So thank you for the question. Gabor, can I make a comment there? Given that I'm also an auditor in this room, that I think for a long time you've been talking about audit being transitioning, transformed, and, and, and looking at data, looking at information technology and data processing. And what you mentioned, Hayden, about the, um, the Bitcoin or the concept behind blockchain being a, sort of an instant transaction almost. Uh, audit traditionally was always looking at the past, right? And just give a, give a clean bill about a point in time. And I don't want to be too philosophical, but I think the way this may actually be going is looking at almost like instant assurance on the transaction itself as opposed to looking at some sort of cumulative data from the past. Yeah. So, um, just, just trying to summarize for the benefit of the online audience, I think somebody told me that audit is like a weather forecast. 
uh, like what was the weather as of 31st December, or <laughs> if it be three months delay. So uh, the the usefulness of, of, the, of that information is is is, is questionable at least. And clearly, with the, the technology that we were covering uh, this morning, we can get to pretty much online weather forecast in the, in the world of everything as well. Right. Any other questions from uh, from uh, the online audience I haven't seen? Nope. Okay, so I think we should give the floor back to Narayana, who hopefully managed to cure the, the technological issues. <laughs> and, and, and and you can you can probably finish your your presentation. Thank you ever so much. I think there is a golden rule that the more futuristic technology the topic of the conference, the more likely is the technology will fail. It, I'm sure there's some kind of mathematical inverse correlation there. Right? Um, uh, so I think, uh, you know, hopefully you've, you've caught the majority of my comments. Uh, I don't think I, I need very much more time, but um, uh, what I'm going to try and do rather bravely is to share my slides again and hopefully this will work. And uh, as before, I would be very grateful if somebody can just tell me when they can see the slides and hear me. Yes. yes. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much. So I, I think I might have um, talked people through this slide. So just very quickly, um, I was just making the point that um, in the work that we're doing, uh, we looked at these uh, 10 different types of job roles and, and we identified two of our uh, uh, members were working in this area so that we can give a bit of a flavor and uh, it's, it's a very case study based approach ultimately. So uh, as I said, the report will be out uh, at the end of May and uh, uh, please, do, please do have a look at it when it comes out then. Uh, I will say just uh, to build on that, that uh, in terms of our approach, you know, when we talk about that wide range of uh, job roles on the previous slide there, uh, you know, all of these people have trained initially as accountants and they're doing a range of different jobs from um, CFOs to auditors to controllers to digital transformation, regulatory experts, strategists, uh, some set up their own fintech, some of them are uh, head of products and payment um, uh, companies and, and operational, head of operations type roles. And I think, you know, the way we see that at ACC is very much that we see the accountancy training as, as a foundation. Um, and it's about having a balanced set of skills. So it's about being able to have strong accounting technical skills, but it's also placing sustainability at the heart, ESG and, and, and so forth was mentioned earlier. It's about an ethical approach to long-term value. It's about insight. Um, so really being able to think about, you know, what are some of the, and, and I think, you know, again, if I can uh, refer back to some of the comments that came up in the audit presentation around, you know, what is the economic reality of the transaction and what are you trying to achieve with it? And that did, that certainly has a huge role to play in how you think about how to deal with that transaction. Um, so, you know, really thinking uh, uh, and also more generally around um, whether that's in the governance and control context or in the business insight and business acumen context. Uh, and also some personal attributes around drive. Um, everything we've done in this piece of work around um, you know, speaking to people in the sector, the ability to be flexible, the ability to pivot uh, and change direction um, in, in a nimble way. Uh, so personal drive and, and also collaboration. Um, no one person can know everything in this space. It's just not possible. And so the only way that you can be effective is if you're effective at collaborating. If you have to be effective at something, that's probably the one most useful thing to be effective at. So I think we see, um, you know, at ACCA, you know, the future facing uh, accountancy and finance professional to be someone who's got that really rounded and balanced um, set of capabilities that um, you know has the technical skills but also a lot more than that and when we looked at that framework and in the context of fintech there were a few things that really jumped out in terms of how it shows itself how does it manifest but when we looked across the different ro job roles and the people that we spoke to one was around understanding emerging and evolving fintech business models. So, you know, we spoke to someone, for example, who was who audited one of the biggest e-money providers in, in, in Malaysia. And obviously it's a very different way of doing things. It's not a credit card or a debit card payment. Uh, you know, it's not a point of sale system um, that you have inside a, inside a company, uh, a point of sale system that you have inside a merchandise, inside a shop. Uh, it's, it's an app-based payment uh, using QR codes and, you know, if you're auditing that business, you need to understand the business model and how it works. 
um commerciality, the ability to tell a compelling financial story to investors you know pretty much every fintech we spoke to at some point, you know especially if they're in the startup or scale up phase they're looking to you know dress themselves up and and make themselves attractive to investors and accounting and finance professionals are a huge part of you know being able to tell that compelling financial story driving trust through assurance and clarity of financial information and the reporting that goes with it i think the phrase wild west was referred to in one of the previous presentations and i think we're seeing that you know our members um are really being called upon to help uh in in creating a reliable uh, uh sort of narrative within this info, uh, this ecosystem when investors come and look at fintech the first thing they want to know is you know can i trust the numbers you're putting in front of me can i trust the financial projections that you're telling me and they're really looking to accounting and finance professionals to give them that confidence so i think there's a real space here um for these individuals to get involved in this sector and to add huge value we talked a lot in this conversation in the previous sessions the technical accounting for new areas like cryptocurrencies and and many from members getting involved in that uh, a digital first mindset that can operate without volume in its paper trails so if i go back to that first example around understanding merging and evolving fintech business models you know one of the things that the person said to us was you know when you're auditing a normal business you know you have what are the sampling approach or you you, know, you want to get uh you know paper evidence of various things they've done and then you're kind of comparing across different uh uh you know different uh pieces of information that you've received and it's all done sometimes quite manually and in this fintech that was being audited this e money example everything is in you know uh completely in 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 um, uh, a file of the of the transactions because it's a wallet everything is available in in soft copy format and and a huge reliance on rpa scripts Uh, in order to interrogate um, the information that's provided, so it's a very different way of doing things without relying on paper. So you know, I think uh, that that will be a really important part of uh, being able to operate effectively in this environment. Um, RPA, by the way, is in robotic process automation and video fund. Um, and then number six, a flexible approach that can pivot to uh, differing priorities in a fast-moving industry. So I think. this is a theme that came up again and again in terms of success in this environment and what is what is really differentiates people this is not a place if you want to be uh you know you want to be told that this is your job and those are the boundaries of your role um and then everything outside that is not your role um this is probably not the right right world for someone like that um, but this is a very exciting world for someone who is who's able to uh really grab it with both hands and and work uh in a way that is thinking about what is the next um possible thing that you could be doing as a business rather than just what you have done or what you're doing right now um and then i think linking business and finance needs to technology needs uh, came up a lot as well uh, i think uh, and and it's a funny um you know uh, mismatch that we found in many fintech startups because they're very techno focused and they're very much focused about what is the solution we want to give to our clients but often when you think about the accounting and finance approach within the fintech they're less familiar with that side of it and it can often be quite old school and there's a, you know a real opportunity to make sure that their own <laughs> accounting and finance uh, approach and functions are, are are really managed and often this could be one or two accounting people who are setting up the function we we spoke to a lot of cfos who are setting up uh, the function within a, a fintech as part of Uh, scaling up that fintech and making itself attractive to investors and showing that they have uh, proper controls and procedures and you know there's a real need to link uh, you know all those two worlds properly and i think i would say ethical and purpose driven is absolutely the key one of the things about cryptos and fintech um, and definitely cryptos is that some people know a lot about it and most people know very little about it and when you have that kind of imbalance there's a real potential for exploitation there's a real potential for people uh you know for for the consumer interest to to not be satisfied properly and uh, obviously in the case of uh, chartered bodies like ACCA it is there is an explicit ethics charter for our members it's a fundamental part of what they're there to do which is to think about the public interest it's not just the immediate commercial interest uh, and i think that is particularly important in this world um where as it was said before there is a wild west element to it and so always thinking about the ethical dimension is going to be really really important and it's in the best interest of the ecosystem ultimately 
There is no value to the ecosystem of being in the news for the wrong reasons. It doesn't help anyone. So I think in terms of final thoughts, I would say is around awareness. I think you know that that is still a big. When I look across the entire spectrum, as I said, the survey was five thousand seven hundred accounting and finance professionals. These are not fintech people. These are just the whole universe across all sorts of different things. And I think awareness is a key starting point. I think regulatory considerations are going to be a key factor. I think they will determine um, you know many aspects of how uh, accounting and finance professionals are able to engage with the space, add value in the space, and really understanding where that's going is fundamental. And then I think you know thinking about that innovation in the context of a purpose-driven mindset. I think it's uh, something which will really ensure that you generate value, but also long-term value. So I hope that uh, you know gives you a little bit of a sense of where ACCA is coming from in terms of uh, the opportunity that um, is represented by areas like fintech and areas like um, uh, you know digital assets within that. We are not in the business of being cheerleaders for Bitcoin or cheerleaders for crypto. That's not where we are coming from. But equally, we are not in the business of just, as was shown in the previous slide, putting your head in the sand and ignoring it. So where we are coming from is, you know, we want to engage responsibly and most importantly, as an education sector body, we want to be part of the solution in driving greater understanding and greater skills. With greater understanding comes more responsible adoption. That's really our position. So, thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope that um, brought a certain flavour uh, to the discussion that complements what you've heard from from elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Naira. And I think the technology finally, finally was 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 helpful to us. So. This was very insightful and I can't wait to see the publication of this survey. So it's so really good to get a sneak peek into uh, what is coming and why it is relevant for us. So uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, time for uh, any more questions. I think we will have networking opportunity and, and most of the speakers will be around for networking opportunity. So use that to, to ask questions. So if you are online, I think you can probably send questions and we will try to to answer them separately, um, but I think there is nothing left but to formally close the, the conference. So I hand over to Gergely, our host. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you that you if you came and joined us, and especially I would like to thank you who joined us online. Uh, I think all of us are I, I want to thank you for the uh, organizer team particularly Atali and David Vier, and uh, I know this, this festival a lot from ACC and, and TWC. Uh, we started, we needed to postpone it because of the uh, because of the situation, but finally we yeah, I hope uh, everybody might it and enjoy it. Uh, as my takeaway would be, and don't be surprised since I'm, I'm running an educational company, there is a room for training and education and upskilling is very important for uh, particularly in this topic, so Budapest Institute of Banking is here uh, with the name, it's in Budapest, so it's in Budapest, you can find it. You have a, uh, we have a catalog for you, and uh, you can find interesting courses, and obviously we, we have been running over 100, uh, 100, over 100 topics, so all, all kind of topics we are quite active in, in upskilling. So I really recommend that, and I'm going to be the guide for the, for the museum. The money museum, so those who are looking for it, I, I, I will show you. We will, we will get a glimpse of the museum when it's uh, the, the biggest complex that it takes more than two hours to go through. So we will be a shorter uh, uh, appetizer. And if it's appetizer, you can, watch, you can visit facebook.com.au, which is the uh, website of the money museum, and there you will find a, a, an e learning possibilities as well. It's uh, it's again, it's about upskilling, it's about orientation, so it's in a short video, six, uh, maximum 20 minutes, it's covering topics from uh, uh, CBDC to all kinds of topics and we starting to develop this uh, new e-learning platform which is called Economist. Uh, so it's again about appetizers for, 
for changing in the world, and we can see that even for uh, accountants and auditors, there is a there is a there are many promises in the in, the, in this new tech world. So don't be upset, and please enjoy the food. Thank you very much. Thank you for the speakers. I'm so happy to be here. The last and most important part. But thank you.